Our next presentation is entitled Developing uh, a Corrosion Mitigation Strategy for Service Life Extension in Hampton Roads, and the presenter is Adam Mateo, Virginia DOT. Adam is an Assistant State Stru uh, Structure and Bridge Maintenance Engineer for Bridge Maintenance. What we're I'm going to be talking about today is much more specific. It's an actual project that we worked on. It's, it's underway. It's, it's, uh, it's still in the evaluation and, and design stage, but, but I want to just tell you about the approach that we took and, and some of the, what I thought was uh, very interesting and innovative work that we did. It's on the Hampton Roads Bridge Tunnel Approach Bridges in uh, Eastern Virginia. Now, the Hampton Roads Bridge Tunnel, and it's a, it's a series of, t of tunnels and bridges initially built in 1957. It was the first of its kind, and it's, it's a, 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 a series of viaducts that go up to islands, and you can see here in the aerial view, these are, these are man-made islands in the middle of, of, of the confluence of the York and James Rivers and the Chesapeake Bay. And what happens is you drive on this peninsula called Willoughby Spit, because it looks like something somebody spit uh, from a hurricane. And then you drive up to here on this viaduct, and you, you, you descend into a, a tunnel, and then you come back here on another approach bridge. And uh, you can see from here, this is, this is the, the, what we call the peninsula in Virginia. Uh, these portions of the bridges, uh, these two bridges, are, are pretty well protected by what's called Fort Monroe here. And these are not. These are more exposed to the Chesapeake Bay and Virginia Beach, and that's pretty significant. Uh, the original bridges were built in 1957, and then it was widened later in the 70s. And here's another view. This is looking from the Norfolk side, and it, it coming in a long, curved bridge. Very, these, are, these are the longest bridges that we have in the state, coming into the island and then dipping down. It's an important bridge. It's a very important bridge to us, and, and not... We, we developed actually something called an importance factor in Virginia, so we can kind of relatively rank all of the bridges. This is by far the most. And we look at things like detour and traffic and truck traffic and access to important facilities and that sort of thing. Uh, one of the big reasons it's so important is it's, uh, it's right there in the middle of a huge concentration of military bases. Uh, the Hampton Roads area of Virginia is a lot like San Diego and its concentration of military. Now, the, the numbers, that's all I had space to put on here, you get the gist. 20 highly significant military bases. Uh, the Atlantic Fleet is based right here at the Norfolk Navy Yard, uh, but we have a lot of other facilities because they like to concentrate them and make sense. Now, you combine that with a long detour, high traffic, age of the structure, and, and really a limited other access points. There's really, th th this is a new bridge tunnel here called the Monitor Merrimack Memorial Bridge Tunnel, and this is the old Hampton Roads Bridge Tunnel. So if we were ever to lose this bridge, for, even for a short period of time, it would be a big deal. And I can't really emphasize enough just how important it is uh, to, to the area, really economically, really to the nation, I'll say. At any given time, you could see uh, any number of aircraft carriers and, and support ships there at the Norfolk Naval Yard. Uh, Newport News Shipbuilding is, is up on the peninsula. That's one of the few places in the country that can still build uh, nuclear submarines. And then Oceana Naval Air Base, because again, they like to get some synergy by putting these things in the same area. No, that's the public stuff. And on the other side, there's, there's a lot of, this is an engine of, of uh, the economy for really the entire country again. Uh, the Port of Virginia has a series of ports in the area. And it's, uh, I think, just behind the port of New York and New Jersey and the most active port on the East Coast. So really important place and bridge. Uh, uh, aging now and, and not doing so well. Uh, uh, well, I, maybe, I, you know, I don't know. Maybe that's a relative thing. So these are the general condition ratings of, of the various approaches and when they were built. Now, the original 1957 structure was widened in 99, a little more on that later. Uh, uh, the westbound south approach is, is now structurally deficient. But mostly these, gener these general condition ratings hover right around five. That's where they are, and, and that's where you would expect them to do to be. Uh, a little background on where we are. Here's, here's uh, before I get into that, uh, some, uh, some inventory data. They're just to, to emphasize, there are large, old, long, big area bridges. And this is, the, just to give you a sense of the number of vents and caps, it's, it's a big problem in addition to important. So, so I'm going to talk kind of globally for, for a moment about where this bridge sits in the broader context of bridge maintenance in Virginia. It's something we have to deal with. Uh, I, would, I 
I really appreciated the, 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 the funding constraint discussion that we heard earlier. That's, that's really what we're all doing. We're trying to figure out how do we best spend the money. And let me give you the broad context of where we are in Virginia. Right now, these bridges are, are being, uh, there's a parallel route that's being built uh, at the Hampton Roads Bridge Tunnel. That is being built with a specially dedicated tax fund, local tax fund, that can only be uh, applied to expansion of, of new lanes. Can't be used for any kind of maintenance or anything. That's VDOT's problem, that's over here. So whatever improvements or however we deal with these existing structures, we have to use our existing funding streams to do that. That's ensconced in law, we really can't get around that. And, and while they are building more capacity, it's not gonna be nearly enough capacity to, to, to retire these old bridges. So we have gotta keep them in, in, in life for a long time. Now we looked at it and we said, uh, I don't know what the exact estimate is, but somewhere in the $700 million range to replace these bridges. And I'm not even talking about the tunnels. We have over 21,000 structures statewide, and we're a little different in Virginia than other states where the state actually owns and maintains the vast majority of its structures. We have some counties and cities and towns, about 10% of the bridges and roads are, are maintained by them. But for our 21,000 structures, after you take away the mandated things for inspection and load rating and operations, we have about $160 million to maintain our, all those bridges. And we do have a nice capital improvement uh, fund. It's about $220 million. Uh, but our replacement needs are about $400 million a year. So we really have, a, we, we have an economic pickle, and that's why, that's why we got into this, this project here. What we've done is, is we've identified that we have these 21,000 bridges, but in addition to that, or as a subset of that, we have 25 what we call special structures, special needs structures. Uh, they, they, and we kind of, you can, yeah, I don't expect you to see the detail on this, but the green are the tunnels, the, the, the pink are the, the movable bridges, and the blue are the either complex or large fixed span structures. And the Hampton Roads Bridge Tunnel gets, gets on there both because they're large bridges and because they're tunnels. Just these bridges alone, these 25 structures alone, they have about a 50 to $80 million maintenance need for the next 30 years with the long range plan. So we're constrained, we're heavily constrained, so what do we do about it? Well, what we did was we got uh, uh, Ali Akbar from Concor and WSP to do a very detailed evaluation and life cycle study of these structures and to give us some options on what we might be able to do. The first thing they did, they went out and, and did a quantity uh, uh, summary. And, and what these are broken down by is, is uh, different types of, of deterioration, cracking, imminent spalling, spalling, failed patching, and broken down by structure. And you'll note there's a lot of purple on these because that's, the, that's that bridge that's really as uh, closest to the bay and to the beach or to the um, Atlantic Ocean. So it gets a lot of salt. And in addition, um, of course, that's the one with the, the lowest uh, depth of cover. So we did it for the substructure, the superstructure, and for, for the decks as well. Now, again, this is, this is just a high-level summary. I don't expect you to really digest the, that list there, but what they did is they went out to, they cataloged all the elements. They took chlorides, they, they did a, a very thorough look at this thing, and, and, and uh, not only just total chloride, but at various depths. And this kind of shows you what's going on with these existing structures. These are, this is, these are not the initial piles, these are pile jackets, but their deterioration is, is significant, and they're at the end of their life, so we've got to deal with it. Part of the, the assessment was a corrosion condition evaluation, and they did chloride profile analysis, carbonation testing, clear concrete cover survey, delamination survey, and an electrical con uh, continuity survey. Just put this up here to, to show you what the, the, the fancy equations that they did. Many, many of you will be familiar with, with the, 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 the diffusion laws and the accumulation laws for chlorides. But what we were really about was we were trying to do a long-term look at this thing. So we wanted to kind of understand not only where we are today, but where are we going with the existing concrete, the existing uh, depth and concentration of chloride contamination in these structures by element and component. So we broke them down separately. Uh, the deck condition varies by deck. Uh, the, the eastern approaches, and now that's, that's the part closest to, to the Virginia Beach side, 
they they have actually an existing impressed current cathodic protection system in place that was part of the the, the rehab. Unfortunately, it has a titanium mesh and, and an overlay. Unfortunately, that only worked for a few years. We we had a lot of lightning strikes, and which is interesting, but didn't really realize just how many times that bridge gets hit by lightning. That was very uh, informative when we found that out. And, and, and the problem was had to do with uh, improper grounding. So we have this impressed current system in there, but it just really hasn't really worked. So we want to get that up and running again. This is, to me, I thought was, was one of the, the, the nicest parts of the study. I'm not going to dwell on this graph. I'm going to show you a series of these graphs by, uh, deck, uh, by, by bridge component. Um, but just to, to show you as an evaluation tool, it was a really nice kind of summarizing way uh, for us to look at this thing, look at each component, and understand, okay, where are we now and where are we going? And uh, I'm going to thank Ali for putting these together. I thought they were really nice. They, this is a, a diffusion fit of the chloride concentration uh, from the surface uh, down through the depth. This is, a, 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 as, as a percentage, the depth of cover of various steel components, the dash being long, longitudinal bar, uh, short dash, long bar is the, the transverse rebar. And this is the, the corrosion threshold. Now we set that at one pound per, per cubic yard. Now some people may be, the, the, you, you all are corrosion experts, so you probably say, hey, it's higher than that. But we're looking at when, when does that corrosion really start? So this allowed us to kind of at a glance understand, okay, where's the, where is, the, the uh, chloride contamination now, how deep, and how does that fit with the bar? Not just the, the shallowest bar, but all of the bar. So we have a, 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 an accumulation here of, of the, the cumulative cover goes in, you know 10% all the way up to 100%. So this allowed us to kind of understand at a glance what was going on. Now, uh, one of the interesting things about the Western approach decks is they're in pretty good shape. Now, again, that goes back to that protection from, from the, the uh, Fort Monroe Peninsula, but also because this is one of the first bridges in the country that we know of that got a polyester overlay. That was back in the 70s when we were first evaluating epo uh, epoxy and polyester. It's, it's long since gone, but I think that really inhibited a lot of the chlorides from getting in there. So it's a thin overlay. It's ready to be replaced. So I'll just kind of walk you through the different, the different uh, components and, and, and things that we looked at. For the beams, uh, the southern approaches have a lot more damage than the northern approaches. Again, that has to do with exposure, but also the lower cover and, and the wave action. And I think that the, the, some of these beams are actually inundated in certain events. Now, I'll say for Virginia, I know every, every state has different problems, and, and, and you know, California has seismic, and everybody has something else that they worry about. For us, our deterioration is a corrosion problem. That's, that is the thing that gets our bridges to deteriorate. And, and for most of the state, that corrosion problem comes from above. Salt road salts, water, snow, and ice kind of leaking down, and the familiar problem, joints and all that, beam ends. But when you get into to the geological zone known as the tidewater region, you, a lot of that salt and water comes from below, so it's a different kind of problem. But when, the, when, when those beams and substructure elements get hit by uh, salt water over and over again, it's a real issue. And, you, and we see that here, and some, here's some of the pictures of the worst stuff, but uh, this is what happens. Uh, just a side note, these are what we would call old concrete. In 2003, we went to high performance concrete for all new bridge elements and rehabilitated elements, so low permeability, uh, the poslins, and that sort of thing. But these are old, porous, spongy uh, concretes, and so you see the effect of the salt getting in, uh, 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 delaminations, spalls, and, and, and constant repairs. Now I'll show you these, these these uh, uh, graphs are put together for the various elements. Here's the southwest approaches. And what you're seeing here, when you look at this diffusion fit of, of the chlorides, you see the chloride has gotten much deeper in here. So uh, we find that, that, that and this, this kind of intersection kind of shows what you, where the corrosion threshold meets the diffusion fit. We're, we're at, at uh, three and a change uh, inches deep 
where we get to a pound per cubic yard. And, and I should emphasize, they took a lot of samples. You can't just take one sample on an element and say, hey, this is what it is. This is, this is a, a, a statistically significant sample of chloride uh, contamination. Now compare that to the depth of bar. So we're down here where we're, we're, get, we're anticipating corrosion to, to start. And then here's the bars way up here in the shallower range. So it's, it's a big problem for these beams. Similar here for the southeast approach. Very deep, very concentrated. At the surface, we're, we're up here, what, uh, seven and change uh, pounds per cubic yard in, in chloride. Uh, not much depth of cover, a real issue. And, I, and I'll go quickly. We did it also for the pile caps. And, and for the pile caps, they, they vary by era built. And with the, the initial pile caps were square piles. Uh, uh, kind of an interesting historical note for, for this bridge is it helped the initial bridge, along with the Chesapeake Bay Bridge Tunnel, which goes from the eastern shore of Virginia to Virginia Beach, they helped build the, the precasting industry. Really, it was uh, a company called Bayshore Precast uh, was established in Cape Charles to help build these bridges, and that, that really helped kickstart the industry in, in the country. Um, but a lot of those, that concrete was very porous. So the older, older uh, uh, piles and pile caps have, have seen a, a tremendous amount of chloride, and concentration and depth of chloride uh, 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 contamination. And here's the, here's the pile caps, and you can see uh, what's going on. Just what you expect in the, this, this heavy salt environment where you get a lot of exposure. Now, I'll say this. We have, we're going to, we have the funding for the parallel structure, and we're going to build that. And so we have to deal with these existing structures. And, and all of this stuff, all this decay and, and deterioration is entirely visible from the new structures. That's a bad look. So we have got to do something about this. We, we're, we're not really in a position where we can just kind of leave it and say, well, gosh, I wish we had more money. That's, gonna, that's really not good stewardship. And here's, these are some of the better piles. Uh, our colleague Michael Brown, I think he did a, a very detailed uh, uh, survey of these piles when he was with VDOT at the Research Council. And what these, these are actually not the initial piles, these are piled jackets that are, that have reached the end of their lives. But, but, but ugly and messy and definitely in need of, of, of a substantial repair. And here, here's again the, what, the, the, this same kind of graph, and it just goes to show you the difference between certain kinds of uh, kinds and times of construction. The square piles, highly contaminated. Here's this curve. Uh, of, of the contamination. Here's the depth of cover. So we're way deep, way past the bar for what we consider a safe level of, of, of contamination. The newer circular piles, not so much. They, they, the depth of, of contamination is not so bad. And these are the, the, the northeast approach, the, the, the square and circular piles. And what's interesting, again, is that exposure really affects it. You see a lot less uh, contamination even on the square piles, the older piles, than you do on the circular piles. And, and as part of the, going back to that, that diffusion, um, that, that predictive analysis with, 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 you know, when and where is the concrete uh, going to get contaminated, they did an estimated projection of damage long term, and it's not good, right? So we're, we're looking at 50% damage uh, over, over time. So really, we have to get on this thing. They made a series of recommendations by component. Uh, for the deck, uh, one of the, f the, f the first things is to, let's get this impressed current cathodic protection system going again. We have a nice titanium mesh in there. Let's use modern uh, rectifiers. Let's, let's kickstart this thing again, and let's address the problem that, that caused the problems in the first place, the grounding, and, 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 and get a new electrical system. So that's certainly something we can and will do. Uh, repair and make uh, that impressed current system operational. Now this is a bit of a, of a typo. We do not want to do type B patch repairs in, in roto milling. We want to do a, a what we call a shallow hydro. We want to uh, go in and, and, and take out 
we'll start with a hydro, uh, with a rotomilling, milling, but then follow up with, with a hydro and come in with a, a, a low permeability latex concrete or silica fume concrete overlay. And we'll do that for all the decks. And we'll do that in conjunction with joint elimination because even though most of the corrosion and contamination comes from below, you still get salt from, from above. It snows down there, not, just not as much as the central Piedmont and, 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 and mountainous regions. So with the nice thing about the hydro is that, that you don't have to patch it ahead of time. The, the hydro picks up the, the, those soft spots automatically. For the beams, and particularly again for those heavily exposed areas, we have, that was, that was I thought, really one of the, the, the best findings of this study is we were in a tough spot. We were really looking at superstructure replacement for certain parts of these, these highly exposed beams. And we are going to have to replace beams. There's just no getting around that. Some of them are just too contaminated and too damaged. But we, we, we also, so look at the, number one is the most aggressive. Number two is the ones that are least damaged. We think we can patch those and, and, and you know, kind of coat them and, and, and hope, hope that, that uh, the deterioration won't be too bad or count on that. And then the third is kind of in the middle where we have enough uh, contamination there and enough damage, but we don't really feel the need to, to replace the beam because that's an expensive proposition. Uh, what, we'll, what we're gonna do is a hybrid cathodic protection system. And, and we, we had a lot of discussions with Ali about this is we, we did not want to go with an impressed current system with, on, on a, a, a pre-stressed girder with, with tendons because we were afraid of, of hydrogen and brittlement. But the, and we, we weren't completely sure that, that a, a, a passive system or a, 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 a galvanic a, a <laughs> protection system, the, the, the normal system would, would, would really work. So what we wanted to do was kind of charge it for a week or two uh, and passivate the steel, so you put a, a, a low current on, on the bar or, and on the, uh, the strands for about a week, and then repassivates the steel, and then you can, you can put in a sacrificial anode and, and, uh, it, in, in addition to the repairs. And we think this is, was really uh, the best way forward. We feel pretty good about that. For the pile caps, we are going to follow Ivan's and Jeff's and Florida's great example. They have a, a tremendous system for press current uh, 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 cathodic protection systems on, on their pile caps. We're going to copy that and, and, and for really as many of these damaged, uh, uh, I'm sorry, I, I, I'm, I, the, the, uh, it's for the, for the, uh, the, um, the actual piles, the pile jackets that we're going to do the same thing as them. But we are going to put an impress current system on the caps as well. And we're going to go with this 50-year 50, uh, 50 extension option. And that's the plan right now. The jackets, we're going to follow the, 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 the Florida example. And they have an excellent uh, uh, special provision and, and system that they've, that they've had good success with. We've reached out to them a lot. And I apologize, this is an extra slide. Uh, and so, so there were several options, and I don't want to burden everybody with, with, with all the options that were put forward. They looked at, at it in a life cycle analysis perspective. Big picture, it's about 100 million bucks. And, and we think that we can get 40 to 50 years of good service life out of that. And, and uh, that's really going to be our only option. I guess we have a low option, which is more in the 15 to 20 million dollar range. But, but really, this feels a lot more comfortable, and we can probably you know, you know uh, twist some arms and, and buttonhole a few legislators to get that done. Because again, we don't want to, to have this brand new bridge and, and tunnel system just to the side of this and have structurally deficient older bridges right there. So this is the one we're gonna go with. And it kind of, looking at it really, just to end with this, this was our, this was our choice. Ideally, we'd love to have a, who doesn't want a brand new bridge? Yeah, that would have been great. Uh, uh, had we gone with a new bridge or a new series of bridges, uh, approach bridges, everything we do uh, in, in east of, in, the, in that tidewater geographic zone, we require carbon fiber, fiber strands for all new, new piles that are going to be in any kind of saline environment. And of course, uh, low permeability concrete, we do that for all bridge elements. Uh, stainless bars in the deck, because it's an interstate, we, we require a corrosion resistant steel for all deck elements, and then stainless stands in, in the ashto girders, the pre-stress girders. So I think you could really put that together and, and say, I, I think 100 years is absolutely reasonable for that. 
but that wasn't really an option. So I think that, that, that we came away really good from this, and we're going to use this as a model, this, this method and this technique for, for of evaluating other bridges going forward. So. A significant challenge you got over there. And um, I, I see you're using a lot of cathodic protection and uh, hybrid systems and everything else. I'm wondering how you're going to be able to keep track of how all these things are working and if you've got sensors that you can determine and, and stuff like that, because that looks like the challenge of keeping those systems up and running to achieve your 40-year service life. That, thank you. That, that, that's a great question. We have, um, uh, in, in Virginia, I don't know, a dozen or so impressed current systems. Nobody knows how they, what's going on with any of them. They, they, they get built. They run for a while, we forget about them. And that was another thing that we got really from outreach with Florida because they've, been, they've really put a dedicated force to that. So to answer your question, we have got to make a commitment to having a dedicated person and contract for maintaining that and our other cathodic, press current cathodic protection systems because it, it does us no good to spend the money on these things and just walk away. And that's what happens with, with DOTs and probably government in, in general. It's, it's easier to build a thing than to be aware of it, monitor it. So we have got to pay particular attention to that. And what we're trying to do is get a series of very long-term contracts so big picture, the way our structure will work, and uh, Jeff Milton, our colleagues, working on how to procure all this. It's, it's sometimes procuring these things with the government rules is as much of a challenge as the technical part, because other, all y'all are working on the technical part. We can kind of you know, borrow that where we can. But, but working with the government rules on procurement, it, it's very hard to get a long-term contract to, to work. But we think we're going to get there. But in addition to having a contractor do the monitoring and the maintenance of these systems, we need a dedicated group or person at first to say, yeah, I'm, I'm the man or woman who knows about these systems. I'm the one. So that when we want to know, hey, how's that going, we call Johnny or Jane and they'll tell us. But, but great question. For the piling, uh, how did the comparison or did you consider passive uh, CP jackets not the impressed current, but just the zinc jackets with the bulk zinc anode, uh, which don't require the monitoring, but I don't believe they last this long. But how did, did that fit into the equation, and how did they compare? It, it did, and it does. And, and, and we, this is a big debate internally at VDOT, because we have two things going on there. One is oysters, and they're, they're apparently very sensitive to zinc. Now, every boat <laughs> coming in and out of Hampton Roads has zinc all over it, and it's probably dropping zinc everywhere. But when you come in and you go to an environmental uh, uh, meeting and you say, yeah, we're going to put 30-pound uh, bulk anodes down in here near your, these oysters, it, it, it's not well received. That was one big issue. So that, that's something we really have to think about. Is and 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 I know I, I know there you can use embedded anodes and other things, but but they don't work as well, my understanding. So we have an environmental concern with exposed zinc anodes, uh, bulk anodes, and and the other part is we really feel like this impressed current system, if done right, can give us much more life, and and so we we don't want to come back. In 25 years, and so, so, you know, how how long does it take for that bulk anode to get consumed? And you know, I don't know, 20 years, 15 years, and is is anybody going to? Well, then we have that maintenance issue that Jeff brought up. You know, somebody monitoring that, and what we don't want, we, we really want to go out and spend this money now and give us our longest life. But it's a great question, and I think it, it was not just resolved on this particular bridge, but generally. That, that in the, these brackish and, and, and salt environments, we are n particularly when there's oyster uh, nearby, we are not going to put in um, sacrificial bulk anodes. A little concern. You said something about pre-stressing steel in these uh, both beams and also in the piles, possibly controlling that impressed current system with the amount of resistance changes that are taking place with proximity to water is going to be not only very challenging, but you're also going to be having a lot of current dump off into the water. Have you considered that on your environmental aspects for the oysters as well? Because uh, a hybrid galvanic system without a bulk anode could essentially be conceived without having the zinc in uh, the bulk anode requirement. 
That that's very interesting. Not to my knowledge. No, I and I don't know. Can I uh, get a lifeline from Ollie here? You got to. Can you? <laughs> about the, the hybrid system. Can you guys share at this time what will that be, uh, consist of? We are looking at several different options. Uh, there will be... Okay, I'll wait for the mic. I thought I was loud enough. Uh, there are a couple of uh, hybrid systems you are looking at. Number one is the, there's a system out of UK that has been used in Australia on a couple of projects. It's been used in Scotland and other places where you use a zinc anode initially as your impressed current anode, and then you let the zinc work after that as a galvanic anode. You shut it off, you, you run it. There's now, uh, Vector has another anode that's available where you have an impressed current anode in it and a zinc anode. So your impressed current anode, either you can run it of battery or you can run it of power. On, imp on these pre-stress beams, we want to be able to control the current. So what we would like to do is we want to use a rectifier to put out the current and monitor the potential so that we know we are within the range for that month or two. After that, then let the zinc anodes run. The third option is use a temporary impressed current system with a titanium mesh or something like that. Take that off and then let the galvanic system run. So that will probably be taken care of in design. It, and of those, I like the last option the best. Yeah. <laughs> Let's hear it for Adam. Uh, the preceding was produced by the National Center for Pavement Preservation. More information can be found on the web at pavementpreservation.org. Additional support provided by Michigan State University.